drage gledateljice, dragi gledatelji, ovo je peta emisija EU28 u kojoj govorimo o Europskoj uniji i hrvatskom eurointegracijskom procesu. Znamo tko su predsjednik Republike Hrvatske, predsjednik Hrvatskog sabora i predsjednica vlade Republike Hrvatske. A znamo li tko su čelni ljudi Europske unije? Znamo li tko su Herman Van Rompuy, Jerži Buzek i Jose Manuel Durao Barozo? Znate li tko je predsjednik Europske komisije? A, ne znam, ne znam. Ma ne zanima me ni za Evropu i za Hrvatsku. Tu ne znam. Ne. Poljak Jerži Buzek, 24. je predsjednik Evropskog parlamenta. Prvi je čelni čovjek jedne institucije Evropske unije koji dolazi iz postkomunističke istočne Evrope. Po vjeroispovijesti je luteran, a po struci inženjer kemije. Za vrijeme komunističke vladavine bio je istaknuti dužnostnik sindikalno-političkog pokreta Solidarnost, kako u njegovoj legalnoj, tako i u ilegalnoj fazi. Član je Poljske, građanske platforme i pripada grupi Europske pučke stranke u Europskom parlamentu. Za njegov izbor glasovalo je preko tri četvrtine zastupnika u Europskom parlamentu. Mandat mu traje dvije i pol godine, do polovice siječnja 2012. godine. Tada bi ga na polovici mandata sadašnjeg saziva Europskog parlamenta prema političkom dogovoru trebao zamijeniti predsjednik socijalističke i demokratske grupe u Europskom parlamentu, njemački socijaldemokrat Martin Schulz. Jerži Buzek zastupnik je u Europskom parlamentu u drugom petogodišnjem mandatu. Četiri godine bio je poljski premijer. U tom je razdoblju bio i zastupnik u Sejmu, donjem domu poljskog parlamenta. Poljsku je uveo u NATO te izvršio pripreme za ulazak u Europsku uniju, što se poglavito odnosi na decentralizaciju vlasti. Belgijanac Herman van Rompuy, prvi je predsjednik Europskog vijeća, tijela koje okuplja šefove država i vlada država članica Europske unije. S obzirom na činjenicu da dolazi iz belgijske politike, nije ni čudo da ga se smatra majstorom često i na izgled nemogućih kompromisa. Ipak, Europsko vijeće vodi na sebi svojstvene način, ni kao puki gledatelj, ali ni kao diktator, već kao čelnik kojem je zadatak da olakša dijalog i potakne dogovaranje. Na dužnost predsjednika Europskog vijeća službeno je stupio mjesec dana nakon stupanja na snagu Lisabonskog ugovora, sukladno kojem je uvedena njegova današnja dužnost. Mandat mu traje do kraja svibnja 2012. godine. Prije toga bio je belgijski premijer, predsjednik zastupničkog doma belgijskog parlamenta, belgijski ministar za proračun, zastupnik u zastupničkom domu te senator. Možda najkontroverznija epizoda njegovog političkog života povezana je sa skeptičnim komentarima iz 2004. godine glede primanja Turske u Europsku uniju. Tada je, između ostalog, izjavio Turska nije Europa i nikad neće biti Europa. Međutim, prošle se godine afirmativno izjasnio Turskoj. Portugalac Jose Manuel Durao Barozo, predsjednik je Evropske komisije već šest godina i četiri mjeseca. Ako svoj drugi petogodišnji mandat odradi do kraja, postaće uz Francuza Jacques Delora, drugi predsjednik Evropske komisije kojem je to uspjelo. Predsjednik Evropske komisije postao je kao član Evropske pučke stranke, a kao portugalac bio je prihvatljiv i tadašnjem britanskom laborističkom premijeru Toniju Blairu. Naime, bio je jedan od sudionika sastanka Koalicije voljnih 2003. godine s američkim predsjednikom Georgeom Bushem mlađim, britanskim premijerom Tonijem Blairom i španjolskim premijerom Jose Mariom Aznarom, na kojem se dogovarao napad na Irak, u kojem je Portugal sudjelovao s neborbenim postrojbama. Durao Barozo, kako ga zovu Portugalci, u ranoj mladosti bio je blizak krajnjoj ljevici. Više od tri desetljeća član je Portugalske socijaldemokratske stranke, u kojoj je obnašao više značajnih dužnosti, a ta je stranka politički pozicionirana na desnom centru. Pet godina bio je predsjednik stranke, šest puta izabran za zastupnika u Portugalskom parlamentu, bio je na čelu parlamentarnog odbora za vanjske poslove, državni tajnik za unutarnje poslove, državni tajnik za vanjske poslove i suradnju, te ministar vanjskih poslova, a dvije godine bio i portugalski premijer. Među najvažnijim stvarima po kojima se pamti njegovo razdoblje na čelu Europske komisije ističe se Lisabonski ugovor koji je stupio na snagu 1. prosinca 2009. godine kojim se izvršila reforma institucija Europske unije, a posebno ojačan položaj Europskog parlamenta i značajno smanjen takozvani demokratski deficit u Europskoj uniji. 
ima li netko iz Hrvatske za koga smatrate da bi uspješno mogao biti na čelu neke od institucije Europske unije? Nema ništa, idemo u propast. Mislite li da bi za Hrvatsku bilo korisno da neko iz naše zemlje dođe na čelo neke institucije Europskoj uniji? Uvijek. Ima li neka određena osoba za koju mislite u Hrvatskoj da bi mogla to uspjeti? Ne, ali ih ima sigurno. Mislite li da bi za Hrvatsku bilo korisno kada bi netko iz naše zemlje došao na čelo neke institucije Europskoj uniji? Pa normalno da bi to bilo korisno i da je to normalno, ali ne baš ovi koji su sada, nego neki mladi, mladi sa fakultetom i da bude mladi da govorim najmanje dva, tri jezike. Ima li neko konkretno iz Hrvatske za koga mislite da bi uspješno mogao obavljati tu funkciju? Neko od političara. Jedinio predsjednik. Za nas je vrlo bitan izvjestitelj za Hrvatsku Hane Svoboda, s kojim smo osim ulazku Hrvatske u Europsku uniju razgovarali i o njegovim ostalim aktivnostima u Europskom parlamentu. Good afternoon, Mr. Svoboda. And what is your view on the interim report of the European Commission on uh, Chapter 23 in Croatian negotiations, judiciary and fundamental rights? Well, in the course of negotiations, you always have to point to the things which have been developed well and things which are still open. And I think this report is a very good report in that respect, in showing what still has to be done after showing what has been done. I think um, the message is very clear. The more you do now, before you conclude negotiations, the less you have to do afterwards when the pressure is weak. Of course, the pressure from the European Union, from the public, is very strong now, and one should use that possibility in the fight against corruption, in the creation of an independent justice system, and of course, in the still open obligations towards the minorities. I think, uh, yeah, the Commission put the finger where it has to be put, but it's uh, still possible for Croatia to conclude negotiation as foreseen. Um, in the interim report, there is no date. Uh, in the parliamentary resolution, NEO report on Croatia, uh, the date is mentioned. Uh, the parliament supports uh, the desire of Hungarian presidency to conclude the negotiations uh, in the first half of uh, 2011. Uh, are we more or less likely to conclude the negotiations in the first half, first half of this year than before the interim report? Look, we are a political body as a European Parliament. We give a signal, we give a hope. The Commission has to look to the facts. The hope is that we can conclude the negotiations in June. We can say it's 50 to 50, 50% 50 yes, 50% no. But uh, let's say the signals are clear. It is still possible, but you have to do, as Croatia, the job in reforming the issues uh, mentioned uh, in the interim report. So, uh, politically, we want Croatia to conclude the negotiations in June. And uh, once Croatia signs the accession treaty, uh, there would be a ratification process. Uh, and do you think that Croatian diplomacy and Croatian MPs could do something to convince uh, the members of uh, national parliaments of the member states of the European Union to speed up the process a little bit? Well, I think uh, the, the best message would be there's a strong vote in Croatia itself at the referendum. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, you have to, to discuss the issues uh, with uh, the parliamentarians of the different countries. But the, again, it is very important that Croatia continues the reform process, implements the reform. Because what we're speaking now is about action plan, about setting the conditions, but implementing you need months, if not years. So if the parliamentarians from other countries, from countries who are perhaps more critical, see that Croatia takes it seriously and the Croatia implements the reforms, that will be the best and the strongest message for a strong and quick uh, accession agreements. So you believe uh, that the narrow vote, still positive one, but the narrow one in the referendum could slow down the ratification process? It could slow down if people see, well, they are not very eager themselves. Why should we be fast? Therefore, it is good to fight for a strong vote and good to fight for implementation of all the reform processes. And do you believe that it is possible 
to uh, complete the ratification process in one year? Well, uh, it's very hard because we saw that many countries like Belgium, it is not easy. Belgium still has not a government, um, but um, it's the minimum. It's the minimum possible time frame is one year. So positive vote in the referendum by a strong, by, by fairly big margin would certainly help. Would certainly help, absolutely, because then the message is clear, we want to join the EU and that's the best uh, message uh, Croatia can send. And your home country, Austria, joined the European Union in 1995. Uh, uh, what is your experience? Is it better to start the information campaign informing the citizens of the EU-related issues before or after the end of negotiations? Look, a real campaign must be at the end of negotiations, but we should start as early as possible to mobilize the civil society, to ask non-professional politicians who are for the EU to be more engaged, teachers, mayors, uh, uh, professionals from the employer side and from the uh, trade union side. Because this is not only a political issue and should not be left to the political parties. It's about joining a community uh, and uh, the community is not consisting only of politicians. So that would be the message and this I said again to the Prime Minister, to the Foreign Minister, please start the preparation, go for the civil society, uh, especially in times when you have opposition from parts of the civil society. You have to mobilize the other side of the civil society, those who are for joining the European Union. So the role of civil society is uh, in many ways crucial in, in this process, isn't it? It's absolutely crucial because, uh, again, it's not only that the politicians join or some uh, employers and, and entrepreneurs. No, it's the society as a whole. And there are many critical issues. And the question, for example, always put, do we lose identity as Croatian if we join European Union? This cannot be answered by politicians alone. It's a question of the culture of the country, of uh, diversity, of minority majorities and so on. So it's a real issue of society and Europe is a project which should not be on an elite project. It's a project of society, of the people, and therefore it's absolutely important that the people themselves are engaged and are involved. And uh, be, all the citizens of Croatia would become citizens of the European Union in the That's end. That's it, yes, well, of course. And you as a, a reporter of Croatia are in many ways personification of the European Union in Croatia. Uh, perhaps the, or certainly the best known MEP in Croatia. Uh, and could you uh, bring closer to our viewers, explain a little bit, what is the role of the rapporteur? Well, the role of the rapporteur is to re report to the Parliament. The Parliament, European Parliament, is the first to decide after the conclusion of negotiations uh, if these uh, negotiations are accepted or not. And I think the Parliament, as representing the citizens of Europe, has to play a big role because without consent of the Parliament, accession cannot take place. And what I try to do is, of course, uh, to show that it's not only an issue of political negotiation. It's an issue, are uh, both sides ready, the European Union and Croatia, to come together? It's like with a marriage, you don't only have some rules, it's a question of sympathy also. Are you ready to accept uh, the other side with its, uh, let's say, uh, sometimes strange or not known and not uh, already accepted attitudes and so on? And therefore, this is, is very important to do it not to influence, Croatia has to take the decision, but to show what is important on, on the side of European Union. And there is a cross-party consensus among the political groups in the European Parliament. As we saw on the vote on the European Parliament resolution on Croatia, most uh, MEPs voted for Croatia, and there was only a few or a few dozen who voted against, uh, uh, against Croatia or, were, or abstained from the vote. Yes, the cross-party uh, acceptance and support. Even some of the members who are critical, uh, they show sympathy for Croatia, but they have, out of criticism on the EU as such and so on, they have a negative attitude. But uh, I think that's, that's very important also in the country itself. You have your different political attitudes, you have your differences, your contradictions, that's democracy. You have government, you have opposition. But on the line, joining the European Union, you should have a broad consensus. 
And apart from being a rapporteur for Croatia, you have other duties in the European Parliament. Among other things, you are vice chair of uh, Socialist and Democrat Group, uh, the second largest group uh, in the Parliament. Could you explain to our viewers a little bit about uh, your other uh, jobs, uh, other things you do in the Parliament? Uh, what is Hannes Svoboda doing when not dealing with Croatia? Well, I am parliamentary secretary, that is vice president of uh, the group of the Socialists and Democrats. I should organize from our side uh, the parliamentary work. I am uh, engaged in the delegation for the US, engaged uh, in enlargement issues as such, um, energy issues. As parliamentarians, we have uh, you know, m many things uh, in, in our mind, but I'm especially engaged in the region here in the Balkans because I think we have to avoid black hole between the one part of the European Union, which is going now until uh, including Slovenia and then starting again in, in, in Greece. And of course, I'm fighting very much in the European Parliament for a strong Europe. Europe should not be strong in every details of everyday life, but Europe should be strong enough to let's say, to have some influence in the globalized world. We have the US, we have China rising, India rising, Brazil and other countries. The, the number of European citizens in relation to the world population is shrinking from day to day, from year to year. And to be strong and to have an influence, that's the reason why we have to form a European Union. There are differences between Croatians and Norwegians, or let's say Swedes, uh, inside the European Union. But together, and together with countries not in the European Union, but in Europe, we have to represent our common interests because we have a, a certain way of life, a certain emphasis on the environment, and this we have to fight for globally. And do you believe that the recent crisis uh, could bring peoples of European Union closer together to foster the, uh, the sense of cooperation, to have more Europe? I think it will and it must. Of course, there is strong opposition. The more you grow together, the more people who are against growing together will revolt. You see that in Croatia itself, you see that European-wide. And therefore, I think that those politicians, irrespective of their political allegiance, who are interested to in have a strong Europe, a strong Europe representing the citizen, they have to stick together on these vital issues and on these main issues. And, and fight for this strong Europe. Again, not a strong Europe which is suppressing citizens, but representing the citizens' interest uh, globally. And apart from the countries of Southeastern Europe, from Croatia to Macedonia and Albania, there are other European neighbors, and you're also involved in dealing with them. Uh, you are a member of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of uh, Euronest, a member of European Parliament delegation. And do you believe, once Croatia becomes a 28th member state, that Croatia could help to uh, foster the sense of closer cooperation with uh, those countries of the Caucasus, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, and uh, of Eastern Europe, Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine? Do, do you see Croatia's role in that? Yes, I think Croatia is a very open-minded country. It's, of course, concentrating on the neighborhood, that's clear. But uh, it has many good relations also with other countries and it understands this kind of, of position uh, if you are outside but still want to be in close connection. Therefore, I expect from Croatia support of a very active foreign policy and um, I think Croatia would be an asset also for European Union. It's not only we do the job for Croatia. Croatia is also helping and should help the European Union to develop this kind of reasonable policy to the neighborhood, to the neighborhood in the south, we you know, the, the critical development there, but also to the neighborhood in the east. Yes, of course, we are more concentrated in the region with our efforts, but we shouldn't forget our eastern neighbors who had the similar problems in the past and uh, similar hopes for the future. Yes, absolutely. I think one never should forget. And uh, Croatia in the role of, uh, let's say, uh, having this mixed uh, cultural environment and heritage could be very helpful in showing the diversity of Europe and of uh, creating new links with the neighbor south and the east. And there are of course regional varieties in Croatia, uh, uh, from southern Croatia, Dalmatia and the northern Croatia, there are cultural varieties. Do you think it's a Croatian asset? It's absolutely a Croatian asset. It's the cultural variety, it's the variety even in food and other elements. 
where you combine influence from the nor north and from the south, from the mountains and from the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it's a beautiful country. It's uh, not well known by everybody, but I think uh, coming closer to us, it could be a real asset. And hopefully uh, many of the EU citizens who don't know us yet would get to know us fairly soon. Uh, thank you for your help to Croatia and thank you for taking part in the EU28. Thank you, it's my pleasure. U razdoblju od 2007. do 2013. godine Europska unija planira utrošiti oko 350 milijardi eura u sklopu svoje regionalne odnosno kohezijske politike, pretežito za pomoć siromašnijim europskim regijama. To iznosi više od jedne trećine europskih proračuna za to razdoblje. Fiorella lives in Bologna. She's seen hard times and lived on the streets. Today she's back in work with a roof over her head. Cecile and Gaëlle are photographers. They were able to build their studio in the French countryside thanks to the high-speed internet that's just been installed in the region. Eric is a farmer on the island of Sampso, a resolutely independent island off the shore of Denmark. He sells the straw he produces to supply a collective heating system for two villages on the island. Eduardas lives in Vilnius. At 65, he's discovered computers and the internet. All of them, sometimes without being aware of it, have participated in one of the thousands of projects co-financed each year by European Cohesion Policy. The EU works with national, regional and local partners to deliver development programs on the ground in the 271 regions of the Union. Die Regionalpolitik historisch war immer dazu da, die Gegensätze zwischen Arm und Reich zu überwinden. Betrachtet man über einen längeren Zeitraum diese Politik, dann ist sie definitiv erfolgreich. Wir haben in Europa 271 Regionen. Gegenwärtig gibt es 84 sogenannte ärmere Regionen mit etwa 155 Millionen Menschen. In der nächsten Finanzperiode rechnen wir nur mehr mit 68 solcher Regionen mit etwa 120 Millionen Menschen, so dass Sie sehen, von einer Finanzperiode auf die nächste, also von 2007 bis 2013 und danach äh, werden wir 35 Millionen Menschen haben, die eigentlich eine, ein besseres ähm, Einkommen, einen höheren Wohlstand haben, als das noch vor wenigen Jahren der Fall war. Und das ist nicht zuletzt auch auf die Regionalpolitik zurückzuführen. Regional Policy has had a proven effect in helping the European Union's regions to develop. It has boosted the economy of poor regions by 10% and created 1.4 million jobs across the EU. But there are still significant economic and social differences between regions. For example, the labour productivity of inner London accounts for 296% of the EU average, while the region of northeastern Poland still has less than 45% of average European productivity. The same is true for youth unemployment, which is less than 3.5% in the Czech region of Prague and nearly 28% in the Italian region of Sicily. With a new 10-year economic strategy, regional policy can become an important instrument to support smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. One good example of this can be seen in Wales, in a local company highly specialized in innovative technologies. They produce specific links, which conduct electricity and are used as the basis for manufacturing flexible electronic circuits and intelligent packaging. There are numerous small businesses like this in Wales, notably in the printing sector, which represents 28,000 employees spread over a thousand companies. It's too costly for these companies to invest in research and development. Hence the Dipple project at the University of Swansea, which is co-financed by the European Union's regional policy and Wales. The Dipple project is very important to us because it allows us to use facilities that we couldn't afford ourselves, so that we can use very expensive equipment and it means that we can get into new areas of technology. After Swansea we go to Vienna and the Danube, where Marcus is head of the Nevada project to develop transnational cooperation and sustainable transport at the heart of Europe. So Nevada has zum Ziel, the Zusammenarbeit der Wasserstraßenverwaltungen zu verbessern und zu stärken. 
die Binnenschifffahrt als kosteffizienten und umweltfreundlichen Verkehrsträger darzustellen und Stakeholder zusammenzubringen, die Bezug zur Binnenschifffahrt haben. The Danube should be a vital axis of circulation between the east and the west of Europe. Yet today only 10% of its capacity is exploited. The aim of this project is to increase that use. Eight countries in the region have become involved. To encourage and facilitate river traffic, access to navigable waterways and infrastructure will be improved and a means of communication will be developed. Mit unseren Nevada-Partnern äh, versuchen wir in einer Aktivität ähm, die elektronischen Navigationskarten zu verbessern. Hauptziel Nummer eins ist, den gemeinsamen Grenzbereich abzustimmen. Und das Hauptziel Nummer zwei ist, äh, dass die Nevada-Partner den gleichen Standard äh, verwenden. Investing in innovation and sustainable growth goes hand in hand with investing in people. That's why the European Cohesion Policy supports projects which promote employment and social inclusion. Now let's head for Prague, the capital and largest city of the Czech Republic. In economic growth, business and innovation, the city ranks among Europe's best performing regions. But there are still many people who have gone through difficult times and whose lives would benefit from receiving the right support. The Czech NGO, Association for Probation and Mediation and Justice, co-funded by the European Social Fund, helps people with social problems reintegrate into society. This was the case for ex-prisoner Miroslav, who was unemployed and falling into debt. Thanks to this project, he now has a job, a place to live and hope for the future. Jsme rádi, že Združení pro probaci a mediaci v justici díky podpoře z Evropského sociálního fondu může pomáhat takovým lidem, jako je pan Miroslav, najít si práci, najít si bydlení, řešit svoje problémy s dluhy. To deliver even better results in the future, European cohesion policy must become more targeted and result-oriented. But it will still remain an important tool for solidarity, available to all regions. Fokussierung auf einige wenige Prioritäten, etwa Steigerung der erneuerbaren Energie, Kampf gegen die Armut, Erhöhung der Beschäftigungsquote, da soll und muss das Geld eingesetzt werden. Nas čeka dio tog novca kada postanemo punopravna članica Europske unije. Hoćemo li ga biti sposobni iskoristiti? Na dobrobi cijelog društva ovisi prije svega o nama. Gledali ste petu emisiju EU28. Vidimo se ponovo za dva tjedna.